Thank you, Leah, for that introduction. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks to the Chicago Humanities Festival for inviting me. Imagine you're at a fast food restaurant. The menu includes a hamburger, a chicken sandwich, and a fish sandwich. You wait in line, get to the counter, and say, I'd like a hamburger, please. We're all out of hamburgers, is the response. Hmm, OK, then I'll have the fish, the fish sandwich. Sorry, we don't have the fish sandwich today. OK, then I guess I'll have the chicken sandwich. Is that choice? Another scenario, you're at the same fast food restaurant. I'd like a hamburger, please, you say. OK, is the somewhat odd and flat response. The server goes back to the kitchen, bags your food, you pay, you head back to your car, get in your car, open your bag, and you've got a chicken sandwich. Is that choice? Final scenario, slightly different setup. You've got the flu, been home for a few days, haven't made it to the grocery store, nothing in your house to eat. You drag yourself out of bed, you make it to our fast food menu, or our fast food restaurant, where the menu is a hamburger, a chicken sandwich, and a fish sandwich. And you say, I'd like a hamburger, please. This time, you say it in a pained voice, trying not to cough on the server. Sorry, we've got a big group order to fill, so we're not selling any hamburgers, any chicken sandwiches, or any fish sandwiches right now. But there's a pizza joint across the street. Is that choice? These are all questions. There is a question mark in the title, School Choice, for a reason. My hope today is for us to think together about the much more serious, complicated, and consequential scenarios that a group of parents face when navigating Chicago's school choice system. Of course, I have my own interpretations, and I'll, I'll present those. But in the end, our collective debates and decisions about what education should look like and what, the, what role choice should play in education will decide the fate and fortune of families and children in Chicago and beyond. It's my personal involvement in this issue that motivates my research. This is a postcard put out by a civic organization in Chicago charged with marshalling funds to support new school initiatives in Chicago. On the postcard is the CEO of the charter school for which I am a founding board member, Urban Prep, and one of our students. I thought the sentence they used to inspire support for education was an easy fill-in-the-blank exercise. A quality education isn't a privilege, it's a right. But today, the mantra is different. It's a choice. Given my connection to this school, this was strong motivation for me to try to understand what this emphasis on choice means on the ground. So my talk today reports on the words of ordinary parents in Chicago who live in this era of school choice and are thus expected to choose schools for their children and to choose well. There are many types of school choice in Chicago and ar around the country. Through No Child Left Behind, any student can transfer out of a failing school that gets federal support. The two kinds of choice I'll be talking about today are intra-district choice and public charter schools, which is one type of intra-district choice, because that's what we have in Chicago. We don't have inter-district choice. Schools, uh, students in Chicago can't go to Evanston for school. And we don't have school vouchers. So I'll be focusing on those middle two. If school choice unambiguously led to broad positive outcomes for students, higher test scores, higher graduation rates, et cetera, then it wouldn't be controversial. I wouldn't have done this research. It wouldn't be, you guys wouldn't be here today. And we'd all be happy. But that's not the case. I can talk more about this research in the Q&A if you'd like. But for now, the important kind of grounding point is that the evidence about school choice is quite mixed sometimes positive, sometimes negative, and as a result, we continue these debates. We also debate choice because it's not always clear what we're talking about when we say choice, as my opening scenario suggested. So I try to break down choice by thinking about what advocates mean when they say choice, what they're trying to achieve through choice. 
Since my own motivation has been my involvement in improving educational outcomes for African American children, I focus on school choice in the black community. Key themes that emerge in black support for school choice are the concepts of control and empowerment. Other concepts that I won't discuss today include things like agency and freedom, markets, competition, responsibility. The idea of control comes directly from calls by black parents, neighborhood activists, and educators for, quote, community control, as it was called in the 1960s and 1970s. For example, journalist Mikhail Holt reports that on the front lines of the school choice battle in Milwaukee, which is in many respects ground zero for school choice, black supporters of school choice exhorted other black parents to attend legislative hearings on the issue, saying, quote, let them look at your beautiful black faces and say you don't have a right to control where your children go to school. Let them stare you right in the eye and say, we know what's best for you, and what's best for you is to send your children to failing public schools while we send ours to private schools. So to test this salience of the political theme of control, I ask the question, has control of student placement been shifted from the school district to the parents? The invocation of empowerment also comes directly from the language of black school choice proponents as illustrated in the mission of the organization, the Black Alliance for Educational Options. This is a national organization founded by Howard Fuller, who was in the, on the front lines of school choice in, in Milwaukee. The mission of that organization is, quote, to increase access to high quality educational options for black children by actively supporting transformational education reform initiatives and parental choice policies that empower low income and working class black families. The scholarly literature on empowerment offers some additional definitions of choice. Some of these definitions stress that empowerment lies in the exercise of choice itself, regardless of the outcome. It is the practice of choice that matters for empowerment. I call this a weak form of empowerment insofar as the choice itself, practicing some choice, is the empowerment. A strong definition of empowerment stresses access to and the responsiveness of state institutions to parents making choices and that parents have a determinative voice in placing their children in high schools. So I ask of these data that I'll talk about, is there weak empowerment, is there strong empowerment, is there both or not? As I mentioned, like many cities, Chicago allows students to attend schools outside of their designated attendance areas within the district, intra-district school choice. There's a significant variety in the types of schools, of, student, of schools available in Chicago public schools. School types and programs at the high school level include neighborhood schools, career schools, charter schools, contract schools, magnet schools, military schools, selective enrollment schools, small schools, and special education schools. This panoply of options and the specificity of admissions criteria to each of these options illuminates the complex task of cho choosing which with, with which parents and guardians have been charged. So the CPS website describes the process of enrolling one's child in a school. It's as easy as one, two, three. Research, choose, register. But as you will see, and as your chuckles already suggest, it was far from that simple. To find out if parents felt empowered or had control, I interviewed and surveyed 77 African American parents, guardians, and parent figures, who I'll all call, par who I'll call parents, who had children entering two high schools in one Chicago neighborhood. In order to understand different kinds of decisions, we chose parents from one neighborhood high school, which I call neighborhood high, and one charter high school, which I call charter high, located in the same predominantly African-American neighborhood. While charter high parents were less likely to be unemployed, they had higher incomes, they had a bit more education, and they had more access to social resources like a car and the internet, both groups of parents were disadvantaged in an objective sense in terms of still having low incomes, still having high unemployment rates. 
And despite different outcomes, they shared many similarities in how they described their experience of navigating school choice in Chicago. In terms of the schools, both schools are predominantly black and predominantly low income. Fewer than 50% of students at both schools met state benchmarks on standardized tests, although Charter High had somewhat better outcomes than Neighborhood High. Neighborhood High had very serious problems with school violence, whereas Charter High did not. Charter High also compared favorably to Neighborhood High and the Chicago High School average in its daily attendance rate, its graduation rate, and its college attendance rate. Hence, Charter High had a somewhat better profile than Neighborhood High, but both struggled on standardized tests. Studying the subjects of school choice reveals political consciousnesses that are fomented in these experiences. And I, at the end, try to ask what political position emerges from the voices of parents as they maneuver this school choice landscape. The parents I interviewed talked at length about two simple words when reflecting on their educational decisions, quality and access. They valued schools that were safe and structured and that successfully imparted skills that would prepare their children for jobs and college. While they had a clear vision of what they were looking for, they were equally clear that their access to good options in Chicago was limited by socioeconomic barriers of their own and by the external barriers inherent in the choice process. Parents also conveyed important experiential knowledge that often it was the schools that chose students rather than the other way around. So to preview my conclusion, their stories convey limited and weak empowerment and no control. Most parents began with very general statements. If the school could provide a quality education, that was just our first and foremost consideration, said one Charter High mother, using the word quality as if its meaning was self-evident. The words parents used most to talk about educational content was academics often without any elaboration, as in this following exchange with Mr. Gordon, the older brother and guardian of a Charter High student. Okay, so what were your early thoughts about choosing a high school for Joseph? The interviewer asked Mr. Gordon. Academics was the response. Like, what about it was the probing question. Academics was the plain response again. Relentless, the interviewer continued. I had two graduate students helping me, so this was a graduate student doing this interview. Uh, so the interviewer probed, uh, like, what were you looking for as far as academics? Mr. Gordon, now thinking the interviewer was completely dense, responded, in other words, his goal is to go to college. So for Mr. Gordon and other parents, academics was synonymous with college, and a quality school was a school that featured a curriculum that prepared their children for college. Another content-related measure of quality was motivated by having a child with a special need or some kind of disability. Mr. Nelson, for example, a grandfather who, along with his wife, was helping their daughter raise her son, elaborated on his grandson's learning challenges. And he said, quote, his reading, he got to learn how to read, like in a book, without stuttering along the words. Just read it. You have to take his time. He'll know the word, but he reads slow. And I used to tell him that he have to read more so he can pick it up. I have him reading the newspaper articles, me and his grandmother, you know. So he needs improvement on his reading not to learn how to read, but to learn how to tell a story reading it without just stumbling over the words. And Neighborhood High, they say they got a program for that, a tutoring program. An hour or two hours extra in school ain't gonna hurt them. The Nelson family was trying every angle, reading at home to their son, looking for a grandson, looking for a school that would help him read better. A quality school for the Nelsons was a place that offered that extra help. Some parents got quite involved in detailing curricular interests that they or their children had. ROTC, culinary arts, fashion design, allied health, drama, ACT prep, preparation for Wall Street, were just a few of the content emphases that parents and children mentioned when considering high schools. Parents at both schools were much more likely to talk about these components of quality than they were to mention things like teacher credentials or test scores. Test scores were actually a frequent topic of discussion 
but as I'll talk about later, they were seen as an exclusionary mechanism, not as a measure of school quality. In addition to what would be taught in school, most parents stressed that a good curriculum was useless without structure, and closely related to structure was safety. Nearly all parents mentioned safety concerns when considering high schools for their children. Ms. Tinley, a mother of an entering charter high student, shared her thoughts from early on in her decision-making process. She said, some of the questions I ask when considering schools is, is there violence? You know, is there fighting in the school, outside the school? What is the, you know, what is the safety protocol? Is police always out in front? I would prefer police not always be out in front, you know? But if, but if it has to be, then okay. But are they there just to provide safety, or are they there because they think something's gonna happen? When parents see police in front of a school, they see three distinct dynamics. Helpful police protection, a reactive response to prior violence, and the proactive negative labeling of their children. None of these signs suggests a quality school. So what do parents' discussions of school quality convey about their everyday politics regarding school choice? On the one hand, the fact that parents were comparing and making evaluations of school quality could signal that having a choice among schools was actually important to them. It's definitely an indication of the weak form of empowerment. They were engaging in the practice of choice. They were doing the work of choice. But I argue that listening to parents <clears throat> talk about, <coughs> excuse me, that didn't sound like that went away. <coughs> listening to parents talk about their measures of school quality might, must be placed alongside the fact that many parents felt pushed into choice because mostly what they saw were a, an array of bad options. Choice refers to the preferences and elections of parents and students, whereas options are the array of schools towards which parents direct their choices. So options are, is our menu in our fast food restaurant. Choices is when we ask for the hamburger. The parents I interviewed saw their options as limited. For example, even though her daughter would be attending neighborhood high, one mother said, quote, I told her that she needed to go to a good high school, and believe me when I say, neighborhood was not on the list. A charter high mother, who reported not being very optimistic about her options, but was satisfied with charter high, was equally blunt, quote, I was just looking at the schools that I might want to consider out of, you know, the lesser of evils, because I didn't like any of them. But I'm like, well, out of these I have to pick something. Hence, parents tried to optimize quality within this landscape of what they saw as suboptimal options. So how did parents fare in placing their child in a school that in some way corresponded to their definition of quality? 100% of Charter High parents reported having chosen Charter High, a signal that the school satisfied at least some um, aspects of their quality criteria although this doesn't mean that Charter High was their first choice. Many Charter High parents were looking at a number of other places, and if they didn't get into their first choice, they were still satisfied, as these data also show, with Charter High. In comparison, 19% of Neighborhood High parents reported actually choosing it, doing some work, making some decision, and choosing it while 38% allowed the geography-based school assignment process to transpire. The remainder, 43%, said they were assigned to Neighborhood High despite preferring another school to which they had applied. So this was how early on in the research when we were asking parents, so how did you choose this school for your son or daughter? When we asked this of Neighborhood High parents, 43% in the end, we had this number, would say, I didn't choose this school, they put me in this school. So that's the 48% who preferred another option and got a chicken sandwich instead. <laughs> this obviously speaks to the issue of parental control, and those parents didn't feel they had control. Because some parents who allowed the assignment to Neighborhood High expressed regret about it afterwards, only 44% of Neighborhood High parents said they were satisfied with the final outcome. 
or 56% were unsatisfied with the outcome, compared to 100% of charter high parents who were satisfied. So for charter high parents, their practice of choice and their ability to opt out of a mediocre neighborhood school is illustrative of the weak form of empowerment that equates empowerment with choice itself, and they realize that weak form of empowerment. The 19% of neighborhood high parents who explicitly opted in to, to neighborhood high and the 44% of neighborhood high who, parents who were satisfied with it also evidence this weak form of empowerment. Whereas the 43% of neighborhood high parents who tried to choose other options but were assigned nonetheless to neighborhood high were unable to realize even the weak form of empowerment. So these data in general provide evidence of limited and weak empowerment among parents. So we see that parents are doing their research as CPS instructs and making some choices, number two in what CPS um, instructs. But what are the barriers? What are the burdens? What are the costs to parents in this choice process? What does it feel like searching for schools when you have our metaphorical flu? Transportation loomed large as a barrier for these families. Only 23% of neighborhood high parents and 65% of charter high parents had access to a car. So bus and train fare was an expense that many parents could not afford. Moreover, the transportation barrier was not only just about cost, but was also about safety. Ms. Cromwell, the grandmother of a charter high student, owned a car and had considered a, di a distant high-performing high school for her grandson. In the end, she decided it was too far because she worried about his safety on those days when she couldn't take him to school. She reasoned that a plus factor of charter high was, quote, if it's one of those days where grandma have a down day where I can't get you there, you won't be hindered. You get on the bus, you go on your own accord, don't have to be fearful. Like I said, at 345, you have to, have to be watchful that the neighborhood changes. Another mother whose son had a learning disability resolved to send him to neighborhood high because it was the only way she could be sure he could get to and from school on his own. She said, because I know that he had different issues of learning and knowing his way. I know neighborhood. I could walk him several times and he would know his way backwards and forwards. That way he could get to school by himself. Transportation and distance in general was the most common barrier, but there were many, many others their own and others' poor health, caregiving responsibilities, unpredictable or rigid work schedules, finances, and the trials of being a single parent. All made it hard to search for high schools and to consider what high schools would be possible to get to once they made that decision. For example, Ms. Cromwell, who I just talked about, had been forced into early retirement at age 55 because of health concerns. Those health challenges and raising two grandchildren were slowing her down. She said, quote, I'm not physically able to do what I did last year. My kids are getting older and they're putting more demands on me and I put their interests ahead of mine. When it was time to decide on a high school, she thought that she would get pamphlets and flyers and information packets from the elementary school or from Chicago Public Schools. A great big campaign, she said she expected. She waited, but, quote, that didn't come. They make you take ownership. And so on to her plate of rearing grandchildren, keeping afloat financially, aspiring to further her own education, and trying to stay physically healthy, she added searching for a high school for her grandson. A final salient barrier to access was unrelated to families' own circumstances, and instead, had to do with the nature of school choice itself. Many CPS options re required students to submit their grades and test scores for consideration. The most elite public high schools in Chicago are called selective enrollment schools, and students must have high test scores, good grades, and perform well on the entrance exam to qualify. There are always more qualified students than seats, so few students have access to the best options. The requirement to submit test scores discouraged many of the parents I interviewed from considering a range of options. For example, neighborhood high foster mother Miss Price commented, quote, math score wasn't high enough to get into Greencastle High School. 
These are all pseudonyms. There is no Green Castle High School. So Chanel's math score wasn't high enough to get into Green Castle High School. But I think the better the school, the more she could excel. Similarly, Miss McFarlane of Charter High narrated how her options dwindled as she learned about entrance requirements for high schools. She said, quote, I got flyers and stuff, but then he wasn't up to par in their, in their, you know, their acceptance. Some of them you had to have a special grade level to even take the tests. But that was just literature that I looked at. I didn't even try to go forth, because some of them seemed like they were so demanding for him. It was hard because I just didn't want him to get lost in the system. I didn't want him to be shuffled with his scores and everything. And I knew he was working so hard, and he has such a good spirit, you know? I just wanted him to have a chance. In addition to recognizing the external barriers to accessing some schools, Ms. McFarland also conveyed a general sense of intimidation by the process, fearing that the competitive testing atmosphere might stifle her son's confidence, her grandson's confidence. I want to spend a little time dissecting how these external barriers worked for parents' own interpretation of the process. So these test scores are one external barrier, and those, the testing regime of the selective enrollment school, schools very much color the process for students, for parents overall. For example, Ms. Phillips stated at first, or at the end really of the interview, Picking a high school is basically like a common sense thing with me because, you know, it's based on the kids' grades, you know, their conduct, what else is there? This statement came toward the end of a long conversation about how Miss Phillips decided on a high school for her niece, Marie, who she was raising. But prior to concluding that finding a high school for Marie was, quote, common sense, Miss Phillips had described how, in fact, Marie had applied to and had been rejected from six different schools. There were still other high schools that Marie wanted to pursue, but Miss Phillips couldn't make it to the open houses to get the application. Therefore, Marie would be attending neighborhood high. This spate of rejections added to the series of roadblocks that Marie had already experienced in her life. Miss Phillips explained, quote, when she stayed with her mother, she had problems, like moving from one place to another. And then Marie fell behind, because really Marie's supposed to be like in the 10th grade. And you know, that had a lot of discouragement and everything for Marie. And now I don't have car fare for her because Marie's mother's not around. So I just try to keep her self-esteem up. Miss Phillips conveyed frustration when reflecting on the roadblock she faced in trying to get Marie into a better school. In its full context, Miss Phillips' common sense that the high school decision was an easy one because Marie's prior performance consigned her to a school that she did not want to attend, actually provides the substance of a political critique. This common sense is a retrospective realization of highly restricted access to good options. This common sense is one of surrender, not of empowerment, not of control. This common sense shines light on the landscape within which many poor and working class black parents and children actually exist. One that is filled with barriers and hurdles and roadblocks and signs of exclusion. Combining the school erected barriers with the challenges of transportation, poor health, single parenthood and more means that the most accessible option for parents I interviewed is the one that does not require them to do any choosing at all. So I'll give just a brief description, oh, I was ahead of myself, of this last point. <laughs> I'll give just a brief description regarding being chosen, and then I'll conclude. Both sets of parents complained about the lack of response from schools once they had submitted their applications, while Charter High parents in particular were stressed by the uncertainty of the lottery. In other words, both sets of parents described being chosen or not rather than choosing. Roughly one out of seven of, all the, of the parents we interviewed reported getting no response from the schools to which they applied. One mother of a neighborhood high student described her confusion as follows. They sent a little application that you fill out and send it back to the school, and my daughter sent it in. Maybe they didn't mail the acceptance or rejection letters out. 
because we didn't get no response from no high school. A charter high mother echoed this sentiment, saying, quote, I'd send the application out and I wouldn't hear nothing. So it's like you would have to do all this follow-up, calling around to five different schools. There was no response to say, well, I got your application or I have your admissions letter, nothing like that. Finally, Mr. Nelson had a attended a CPS high school fair. He had heard nothing back from the contacts he made there, and he described his frustration. I signed up for mostly every school at the high school fair, and I thought that, would be, that I thought would be good for him, and I didn't receive nothing from none of those schools. I had called Dalton, and I called Prosser to ask a couple of questions about the dress code, the grade levels, the school period, and with Dalton, I even talked to some of the students because I used to ride the bus with them. But I didn't receive no flyers, no nothing from none of the schools. No nothing, none of them. The repetition of the words no, nothing, none of them represents both the grievance and the critique. Each reverberation is an indictment of the system that instructed Mr. Nelson to research, choose, and register. He upheld his part of the bargain, and then he heard nothing from none of them. The test for the strong version of empowerment is if parents had access to or were responded to by state institutions. These stories make it apparent that they do not have strong empowerment, and they do not have control. Obviously, Charter High parents all heard back from Charter High, or they wouldn't have known they gotten in and wouldn't have enrolled their students there. But even among Charter High parents, the overwhelming emotion was luck or divine intervention, not empowerment or control. So I just had my fingers crossed that they would pull his name out so that he could be one of those in the freshman class, said one mom. Charter High came out for recruitment and that opened the door for other options. Thank you, Jesus, said another. I just thank God he got in said yet another. These are not empowerment other than the spiritual empowerment that they're conveying, especially given where we are right now. I don't want to overlook that. But it's not the empowerment I don't think that CPS envisioned and definitely not a sense of control over the options. School choice advocates contend that giving parents choices empowers them to influence public school curricula and practices since schools must then compete for students in order to survive. Invoking the most sacred tool of democratic participation, school choice ostensibly allows parents to, quote, vote with their feet. Yet only some of the parents experienced any form of empowerment and then only a weak form of it, participating in the practice of choice. Strong empowerment was lacking as parents struggled to comprehend the array of school options, strained to fill out applications and visit schools, and confronted the barriers to access erected by the schools themselves. Overall, there was no control. But the empirical reality is that there's a lot of mobility in CPS. There's a lot of searching for good options. 70% of CPS students do not go to their neighborhood high school. And this is mostly true in low-income neighborhoods and in neighborhoods with poor performing schools. Seventy percent do not go to their neighborhood high schools. But the people who have the fewest resources and the greatest burdens are doing the most work to make these choices. While high quality schools are the norm in better off white and to a much lesser extent black neighborhoods. These families use their financial resources to buy into high-performing neighborhoods and school districts, and then they put their, school, their child in the traditional neighborhood school. The choice that they exercise is enabled by resources that the families that I interviewed do not have. Moreover, any argument that applauds a little hard work as an acceptable price to pay for a finding and getting into a quality school underestimates the cumulative physical and psychological effort that poor, that poor parents expend in making ends meet and surviving. Such an argument, a little hard work is an okay thing to get your child into a good school, such an argument minimizes also the disproportionate toll that searching for school takes on families for whom even bus fare can pose, pose a financial challenge. 
And such an argument legitimizes the logic that accessing a quality public school should require work in the first place. What then do these parents communicate through their recollections of deciding on a high school? The experience and perspectives of poor and working class black parents in Chicago emphasize unfettered access to quality schools. For many of these parents, access was predicated on a school being close and requiring no effort for enrollment. This invokes concepts that have disappeared from and perhaps are even taboo in school reform debates. Words like provision, state responsibility, entitlement, and rights all require the state to meet people where they are as opposed to requiring citizens to seek out, navigate, and work for public benefits. Choice is always completely dependent on the circumstances of the individual, their knowledge, their preferences, their constraints, their resources. Whereas rights are ideally granted without respect for those individual circumstances. And because choice relies on those individual circumstances, it often exacerbates inequality as opposed to ameliorating it. In the absence of an entitlement to quality schools, black parents will, of course, enter lotteries and line up to secure better schools for their children. They want quality schools. They surely display individual agency in doing so, which was another key word that I wasn't talking about today, but that's important. That, however, is not proof of a pro-school choice politics, but is instead, I argue, a political critique of how the state is currently falling short of these parents' vision of educational opportunity and equity. And I'll stop there, and I think we have some time for questions. Okay, folks, we're going to take about 15 minutes for questions, so if you'll raise your hand, we'll come around with the mic for you. We can start right here. Yes, how, how do uh, the parochial schools fit into this? Uh, could you talk about what their role at all is with respect to uh, choice? They don't really figure into this because in Chicago we don't have school vouchers. So in states that have school vouchers, um, either through a, scholarship, a tax credit and scholarships or directly from the district, um, families can get vouchers to go to parochial schools or any kind of private schools. Um, Wisconsin has school vouchers, Indiana has school vouchers, Illinois does not, uh, although I think it's soon to be politically debated. So parochial schools don't play into the particular story I'm telling. Obviously, they play into parents parents' own sense of what might be out there. For the parents that I interviewed, we asked about that. And the financial cost of parochial schools was something that pretty much none of these parents could, could bear. And so for them, their options were pretty much in the public sector. Hi. Um, thank you so much for uh, your talk today. Uh, as somebody who has been a public school educator now working in the nonprofit education world, I really appreciated what you said, especially around the rights paradigm. I'm curious, in today's challenging Chicago environment where the CEO of Chicago Public Schools is being indicted for and t essentially taking a lot of money uh, that, you know, in, in an environment where 50 schools have closed, I'm gonna, I see increasing distrust in the ability of the public sector to get it done. A lot of your talk focused on parents. I'm curious about what you might say about the impact on students, not just the academic part, but I'm thinking about a story that's unfurling on the southwest side where there's a neighborhood high school and an expanding charter network, and there's instances where the kids are kind of being pitted against each other uh, in, in, in advocating for each of those models. And there's an us and them mentality, which is the last thing that we need to see happen there. I'm curious what you might say about that. Thank you for your question. Um, it's quite unfortunate that, that the recent debates about the school opening on the Southwest side is in some respects reflective of what um, the ideology that motivates school choice. One of the ideologies that motivates school choice is competition. Unfortunately, that battle that we see could be framed as a kind of competition. And it's not, I would argue, 
helpful, productive in any way. One of the other ways in which I think this, the competition ideology is problematic is the competition ideology. Again, the competition ideology is make schools compete, parents will vote with their feet, they'll go to the better schools, and the poor performing schools or the schools that can't attract students will die. The other problematic um, part of that ideology is as schools die, the students die with them. And as those schools are starved of resources, have, you know, don't have a lot of offerings, there are still students in those schools. And our uh, acceptance of the idea that schools might die while they have st students in them, I think is problematic. The last thing I'll say um, in regards to that is uh, a graduate student of mine, um, Bonnie Ponfield, did research on school closings in Newark. And she actually interviewed parents, teachers, and children. And the most heart-wrenching of her data came from the children who blamed themselves for the school closing, thought our test scores were low, and that's why they had to, to close the school. It was a bad school. We weren't doing well. That's why they had to close the school. And that kind of self-blame is also something that I heard among parents when they were dissatisfied, the neighborhood high parents who were dissatisfied with the outcome. The first thing they'd say is, next time I'm going to really be on it. I didn't start early enough. I didn't apply to enough places. I let him or her uh, kind of run the process because I didn't know what was going on and I'm going to you know, be more involved the next time, assuming they had a younger child. Um, and that kind of self-blame, I think, is part of the way in which school choice um, stifles a politics of rights and entitlement and instead produces the kind of battles that you're talking about. I don't have the mic, I so. Have, I have it, thanks. Um, OK, <laughs> thank you. Um, I was struck by your slide that showed um, that parents who had chosen a, the charter high school were 100%, 100% of them were satisfied with that. And I'm, I'm curious if you think that um, how or how the act of choosing influences satisfaction. Mm -hmm. um, we, I was in a conversation recently with Sarah Karp about some of her data uh, that showed how many different students in given communities go outside of their community for high mm -hmm. school. And there was a CPS grad in the in the discussion, and he said, "Oh yeah, well, I mean, we all we all sort of assumed our neighborhood is so bad that anything outside of our neighborhood would be better, even if in reality it was similarly performing. But we chose to to go to it, so and it was outside of our neighborhood, so we had a sense that it was a better choice." Mm -hmm. I think you've hit it on the nose, and this there's this topic is well researched nationally, and the data definitely show that parents who make choices are more likely to be satisfied no matter the quality or character of the school into which they chose, no matter the outcomes of their students. So I think that's interesting uh, insofar as we take satisfaction as a measure, but I think it's only part of the way. Satisfaction is important, and pa satisfied parents might be more likely to be involved, might be more likely to encourage their child to um, participate in school, and all of those things could have good outcomes for the kids, and I think that's important. But satisfaction shouldn't be our only measure. Um, obviously, school quality should be. And the data that you're talking about, again, I mentioned 70% of um, students go out of their neighborhood for school, but it's much more likely for kids in low-income neighborhoods and kids who have a low-performing, a poor-performing neighborhood school, and that those are the parents who I was interviewing with. And again, my point is that that's backwards. These are the parents who have the most difficult time making ends meet in their daily life, and yet on their plate we're also putting this need to travel outside, whereas, I think I have an extra slide for this. Um, so this is, um, People in affluent neighborhoods in Chicago. This is research by Julia Burdick Will at, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, people in affluent neighborhoods in Chicago and people in low income neighborhoods. And you see a much larger percent of students in affluent neighborhoods stay in their neighborhood school as opposed to people in low income neighborhoods. And the travel time also 25% of students in low income neighborhoods travel more than four miles to get to school. Almost no one in the affluent neighborhoods travel more than four miles. Um, to get to school. And so it's interesting that, you know, choice, one of the reasons why it's such a popular mantra is that it aligns so well with some kind of core American 
um, ideologies and language. Free choice is freedom. None of us, you know, one of the big things around healthcare reform was we didn't want a single, single payer system because that minimized our choice and we want to be able to choose what doctor we go to and so on. Um, so choice really resonates, but it's the more affluent who are the least, uh, who are least having to do all of this work and make all of these choices. And so for them, they seem much more happy with just going to their neighborhood school, being assigned to their neighborhood school, um, because that neighborhood school is of high quality. So when the default option is of high quality, the idea of being assigned there is not that bad a thing. Thanks. Could you talk a little bit, what are some of the solutions that you see to some of the problems that are caused by choice? This is the great thing about being an academic. <laughs> I give you all the data and then I pass it along and the next person gets to make the decision. So I will start by talking about my own schizophrenia. You know, I began this talk, I'm on the board of a charter school of which I'm very proud, of which I think we do, and I think we do great work. Um, and so my own participation in the charter school came from we are in a crisis moment right now, what can I do to perhaps increase the options at least, increase the number of seats that parents can try to get into, increase the number of hamburgers at my fast food restaurant so people don't get there and say, we're all out. Um, so I see the participation, obviously personally, of people in the choice sector, whether that's charter schools or contract schools or small schools or any of these magnet schools, any of these numbers, of, there, there's lots of choice. But I think um, I supported the efforts of the hunger strikers to keep diet open, for example, and I think that kind of organizing and hopefully the kind of message I'm talking about today is that we can't lose sight of the importance of making the default options. When I say the default options, I'm talking about the ones where parents wake up on September, whatever is the day after Labor Day, and push Johnny out the door and be like, that's the neighborhood school, go to it, and that that default option is a high quality option. So how do we get to that? I really do think organizing is the way. I think the, I mean, I know the diet hunger strikers didn't see their outcome as a total success, but that it's going to be a neighborhood school and the attention to making it a high quality school I think is the kind of thing that we need to do. Hello. Um, I see that in your data you have some participants who were students who were receiving special education services and one of the big concerns since the charter inception was that those students tend to be counseled out over time and I wonder if that was evidence or emerged from the data that you have. So my method was I interviewed parents at the end of their child's eighth grade year and they were about to enter either neighborhood high or charter high. And so when I say that they were satisfied with their decision, it was that they were satisfied with the outcome, that they were set to go to either neighborhood high or charter high. I didn't then follow parents through that first year to find out if they were actually satisfied with the education they were getting in either of those places. Um, and so I don't know at all about the outcomes for the, for the parents, for the children in those two schools. Hello. Um, question is now, how much time are principals and stuff doing, spending time building their image and uh, doing publicity rather than being educational leaders these hmm. days in the system now? And I also wonder, in the affluent areas, is the board refusing to build uh, additions and new schools um, to make people play the charter school game? Oh, uh, the second question, is the board refusing to build it? Yeah, that's a bigger question than I can answer. That's, I think, above my, that, that's definitely outside of my area of expertise, what the board is willing to do or not willing to do. The first question, Again, you know, I can refer to other people's research. There's a great book called, uh, by Maya Kuchiara called Marketing Schools, which is about the work that you're talking about. You know, in Chicago, you can drive down the street and there are billboards for schools on buses and there are radio spots for schools. And so there's a lot of marketing of schools going on. Um, 
I have not done research to know who in the school organization is spending their time doing that, that marketing. Um, you know, many choice schools do additional fundraising and, you know, some of that, some of those funds go to that kind of marketing. But the marketing is part of, again, the ideology behind school choice, which is that this is a competitive field and your enrollments and your outcomes are what keep you open and thus you have to um, keep your enrollments up in order to stay open. Uh, and the, I think, lack of wiggle room in budgets in traditional uh, in neighborhood public schools would mean uh, less of a budget to do that kind of marketing. Um, although charter schools are funded at 75% of traditional public schools, but then they fundraise in addition to that. And the kind of competition model keeps them needing to continue to market. So I'm not an, a total expert in the kinds of questions that you ask, but I definitely know that the marketing exists. Um, uh, sort of two questions. We'll see if I can throw them in. The first is if you could speak at all to how... A little slower because the echo makes it hard. Sure. Um, the, the first is if you can speak at all to how the parents gathered the information about the schools. And then the second is um, school choice in a lot of ways is predicated on having parents in your life who mm. are available. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the quotes that you spoke of was a parent who didn't get to go to all of the open houses that she wanted to. And I was wondering if you could speak at all to um, where the families fit in our conversations about public education, where there are parents who, for any number of reasons, don't have the time to do any of this and where that leaves their kids. Yes, so the first question, how did parents gather their information? I definitely asked that the, the most common answer was social networks, that they asked their friends, they asked the people at church, they um, asked um, their neighbors. Uh, the second most common way was their own experience was their information. If they had an older child who they had already gone through the process with, if they themselves had lived in the same neighborhood and had gone to the same school, if they had a cousin, those kinds of things. Um, so that's how parents gathered information and that I think is relevant for two, for one important point is that inequality in networks will lead to inequality in information. Um, the in networks with more information, a wider swath of information will then yield perhaps a, a brighter, water, brighter, broader swath of schools. The other thing that that does is, um, oh, the, the other way is, for example, the charter high parents were much more likely to report knowing somebody who either worked for Chicago Public Schools downtown or you know, was a, a secretary at a school or even you know, a security officer at a school, they seem to be a little bit more connected to the CPS bureaucracy and perhaps as a result were a bit more savvy in putting their names in more lotteries. I did find that there was a difference between the number of schools that charter high parents applied to versus neighborhood high pa parents. Neighborhood high parents still on average applied to about three, I think it was three schools compared to, it was either three and five or five and eight, I can't now remember, but there was a difference between the number of schools that each um, group of parents um, applied to. Uh, and you're, I'm using this word parents, but as I mentioned earlier, really who I interviewed were parents and foster parents and grandparents and big brothers and aunts and uncles and caregivers of various sorts. So you're, that's really one of the things I try to emphasize in this um, in this research, which is, uh, first of all, that all children don't have par parents in their lives, and that the caregivers who are in these families, in working class and poor African American families, have a lot on their plate already. Um, and I have a quote actually from a Charter High mom who was very lucky to have gotten into Charter High, but sent, spent most of her time talking about but what about that young person whose mother is an alcoholic and couldn't get the application in? And it's not that she felt guilty about her luck, but she recognized kind of where she fit into this system of choice and that there were winners and losers. And she was quite cognizant of the fact that they were losers, lamented that, was still gonna put her child, because she had to choose and choose well, was still gonna put her child into charter high. But I think she recognized exactly what you're raising in terms of the capacity of parents. I don't mean the intellectual capacity, I mean just the emotional bandwidth and the resources to do so that's necessary to, to do this kind of work. That's all the time we have for today, but thank you so much. Thank you.